So that is a picture of hypertext from my first peer-reviewed paper in 1965. And you'll notice that connections are two-way. And there are two types of connections. Links shown by the thin lines and transclusions shown by the thick lines. Transclusion means the same thing recognizably in two places. So that could be the origin of something or a reuse of something. Now, people say that's not practical. Well, that was 1965. This is 19, 2007, uh, work I've done with Ralph Smith and others, and here we are with exactly the same structure. But maybe you'd like to see it running. side by side. I wrote this one on the left in order to tie together some other things just to demonstrate the fact that the capacities of the system. And this pinkish thing is a transclusion from there, meaning here it is and here was its origin. But we can step between them. So now this becomes the central document and that becomes the companion document. So we have here, in this front plane, this reading plane or firing line, we have a central document and one or more companion documents. Now, <coughs> one of the problems of hypertext is the complexity of the links. Let's look at, some, let's look at the complexity of some links. I'll fly down here. So here we see some links, and we're flying through them, and it's very hard to see where they all go, right? So if we go back to this firing line arrangement, now we can see the particulars of what we're reading, and then step to the next thing and watch it fly in from its position. So this is a solution that helps us concentrate on one page, and at the same time see connections between a lot of other people. I hope this will be a product real soon now. <clears throat> but putting it in 3D gives it a number of extra, extra properties. One is that, uh, that you can fly around. One is that you can see the links in this glamorous kind of way. <clears throat> I love to fly through like this. <laughs> And one is that, in principle, it will allow you to see a lot of stuff together and understand the relationships. Because that is the issue. The point of hypertext was always, as far as I was concerned, to be able to understand really complicated relationships, not the dingy little one-way links of uh, HTML. And uh, I don't know if any of you saw my letter in New Scientist last summer where I apologize for any part I may have had in the creation of the World Wide Web. <laughs> <laughs> I said that uh, when, in, in the system I was working on in 68, the Brown University Hypertext system, I proposed that system of links where they're one way, non overlapping, and untyped, thinking that would be a temporary fix and get us off the ground, not imagining that 30 years later, would be stuck with it because it's, as far as I'm concerned, well, it's far short of what we need for a true literary system. By literary, I mean handling documents the way they should be. Okay. <coughs> Moving right along. When I was eight years old, and allowed to walk to school on my own in Manhattan. I had to cross Broadway, Lower Broadway at 10th Street, 
get to my school. And there's a lot of truck, truck traffic. And I kind of enjoyed being in the midst of traffic. I always did. I still love to drive in Manhattan. And uh, I discovered that if I turned my back on oncoming trucks, they would screech to a halt. <laughs> and so I learned a fair amount about strategics from that. I think I, I always had a strategic sort of way of thinking. <clears throat> when I was in high school, I wanted to work for the Rand Corporation. Now, I'm talking 1954. This was uh, partly because, this was because of the influence of my mother's boyfriend, a guy named Leo Rostin, who was a popular humorist, had written a number of film scripts, but was also involved with the OSS and um, the Rand Corporation. And I was severely perturbed about the danger of nuclear war, and felt that uh, I could contribute something philosophically to the whole issue, and uh, uh, imagined that I might get a job there. That's not what happened, but I found that they only hired economists. <laughs> Now, in 1959, my first year of graduate school, maybe it was, yeah, anyway, in my first year of graduate school, I wrote a paper on the payoff of seeming irrationality, such as an eight-year-old boy turning his back on traffic. And uh, it wasn't very well appreciated in my department, but I found out a few months later that it was very much the same paper that Daniel Ellsberg had written a few months earlier. His famous paper, which was much better and much more academically credentialed, on, uh, on the same thing. 